Healthy, specifically the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network. Charles is um, a fabulous presenter and an amazing man. He uh, does lots of uh, fabulous work in Georgia. <laughs> Can you tell I love fabulous. him? <laughs> fabulous. Uh, I'm so happy that he's here to uh, share with y'all today. Um, I, I was I was so lucky to get to work with Charles in Georgia, and uh, he works with a consumer network, as like we're discussing, as well as many other peer networking opportunities. So, thank you, Charles. Thank you. Uh, and let me say thank you, Carol. Thank you, uh, Nebraska. Thank you, uh, Lincoln, for allowing me, a humble servant, person in recovery, to be here and to share some experience, strength, and hope. First of all, uh, before I get started, I want to do something. Um, I want to give this to one of you. Uh, how many people would like to have? I'll tell you, Charles. Go ahead. All right, all right, all right. What if, what if, what if I do this? How many people still want it? Okay. Suppose I do this. How many people want it? My friends, <laughs> you have just learned a valuable lesson. No matter what I did to this money, you wanted it because it never lost its value. In our life struggles, sometimes we're dropped we'll crumple up, we'll ground up in the dirt, but we never lose our value. I'm here to tell you that uh, no matter what route you've gone and where you are in your recovery, you will always be a wonderful, unique, very special person with a great deal of value. And I thought I'd share that with you because sometimes we just need to be reminded. I bring you greetings from the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network, which is um, I have a membership of over 3,500 individuals who live with mental health uh, diagnosis in the state of Georgia. Uh, I work with the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network, which employs uh, certified peer specialists. And as you well know, Georgia was one of the, uh, well, we are the pioneers of the certified peer specialist program. Uh, this program is being duplicated all across the nation. Uh, Ike Powell, along with Larry Fricks, are heading up that transformation process. Um, and the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network uh, employs more certified peer specialists than any agency in the world, okay? We're really proud of that. We're really proud of the fact that this is a, 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 a support service that's being um, funded through Medicaid reimbursable services. And I understand you don't have that here yet, but possibly uh, it's a way to, number one, put people with mental health diagnosis to work and also carry recovery throughout places in the rural area and other places that we can uh, have employment. So I want to talk about um, what is support? What is peer support? Well, before I get started, let me tell you, I'm standing here today because um, I went to a AA meeting. Unlike what Heather shared, I didn't go for help. I just went for a cup of coffee. It was February 4th, 2001, and I had gone to this meeting before, and this particular day, uh, I was homeless in the streets of Atlanta. Uh, part of what I owned was in a plastic bag, and I had cardboard on my arm. And when I went to um, go to my bedroom or lay on the awning that day, I was faced with a dilemma. That was someone lying there. So even though it was cold, overcast, I decided I'd go to this meeting to get a cup of coffee. And I'd always go to this meeting uh, to get a cup of coffee, but this day it was particular because I had nowhere to go. So I decided I'd have two cups of coffee. Now, in the process of drinking that second cup of coffee, that was a young man standing in front of the group telling his recovery story. By George, his name is George. In fact, George B. is my uh, sponsor today. But George was sharing a story that described what his life was like before he had gotten into recovery. It was amazing that the story that George was sharing was exactly like mine. And for the first time, I dare look into someone's face who had the same uh, issues that I had, the same uh, um, lived experience, but they was a person in recovery sharing what his life was like. 
what it was like, what happened, and how it was today. And he was a productive citizen. I stand before you a convicted felon, homeless person, a person who's duly diagnosed both with substance abuse and mental health diagnosis. But I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg. That is, at age 14, I started using drugs and alcohol. But at age of six, between six and seven, I was sexually abused by a cousin. So I don't know if the substance abuse issue was uh, an attempt to me stop medicating to outlive what had happened or what. All I know is when I found myself in the dilemma of uh, being homeless, leaving my family, um, that I was more concerned with addressing my substance abuse issues. But when I got sober for six months, I realized that those same feelings I had at age 14 resurfaced. But I was not going back to drugs and alcohol. And as a result, I took a suggestion and went to a doctor, got a diagnosis. And since then, I've been taking medication on a regular basis. And I thought that was OK. I was receiving a disability check. I had housing. Um, I have a life. I volunteered in the community. And I remember my boss, Sharon Jenkins Tucker. Now, some of you may be familiar with that name. Sharon Jenkins Tucker is the executive director. She is from West Virginia originally. But she was the um, recipient of the Clifford Beers Award in Mental Health America just this year. And Sherry, of course, came to Georgia. She approached me. She says, uh, Charles, uh, I would like for you to come to work for us. We got this new self-directed project from SAMHSA funded for three years. We'd like for you to come in and work for us. And uh, she said you could work part time. Uh, at that time, I was doing 12-step, double trouble and recovery, DTR meetings in the jails and in the hospitals. And um, I said no. Hmm. I had insurance. I had a house. I had friends. I was doing things in the community. And I was thinking that that was it. That was all the role for me. However, uh, I told her no, and uh, she wasn't. She didn't accept that. <laughs> now, one of the things about Sherry, if you know Sherry, she's a very persistent person. And I love her today because of her persistence, because what she did was she wouldn't take no for an answer. She came back a second time. And of course, my same answer applied, no. Third time. She even called, uh, had some of uh, my colleagues to call me and, and, and talk to me about <laughs> taking the opportunity. See, I was afraid. I was stuck. I was too afraid to return to employment settings. I wasn't, uh, self-esteem was still impaired, still had some wounds, still didn't uh, quite accept myself for who I was, nor did I vi really visualize that I had any, any strength, personal strength, or I had anything of value to share with anybody. But after three times of turning her down, she finally convinced me to give it a shot. And she promised me that she would support me. She has supported me through this journey, and that was back in 2004. I'm here today because of the support that she's given me. Sherry, of course, is a person who's living with a mental health diagnosis, and as an executive director of the consumer movement in Georgia, she has been inspirational in Georgia receiving a lot of grants. We are currently uh, in our second grant from SAMHSA. This one is called the Statewide Peer Wellness Initiative, and it addresses the 25-year gap between mortality and morbidity gap between persons that are living with a serious mental health diagnosis and those uh, people in the community who are not. We are dying 25 years earlier. Uh, so this project was put together to address the lifestyles of persons living in the rural and in the cities of, of Georgia because our lifestyle, living fried food and a lot of drinking and drugging and going on, and <laughs> you name it. But anyway, uh, especially smoking, because we found that 40% of all cigarettes are consumed by consumers of mental health services. Wow. So we put together a program that addressed these uh, risks. But one of the things that the NASHPA study, the National Association of State Mental Health Program directors indicated was each of these risks were modifiable and the uh, uh, chronic conditions that befell us were treatable, which meant then that we could do something about it. So Georgia has uh, joined the national campaign, the 10 by 10 campaign, to eliminate 10 of those 25 years in the next 10 years. Also, recently, as of January, the state of Georgia received a transformation transfer initiative grant from the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors which is going to allow us to, thank you, to allow us after um, 
after uh, doing some research to number one, employ more um, uh, um, certified peer specialists in the workforce and also to address some of the chronic conditions that are facing us as individuals that are causing us our early demise, which is a win-win situation for us. And so we are now trying to um, convince <coughs> providers how beneficial this approach can be, especially when it comes to funding and also addressing the whole spectrum of a person, the mind, the body, and the spirit, engaging us also in the communities. Because what is the use of us having um, wellness if we're not applying it by being a part of the community and thus being part of the, um, uh, the universe as a whole. So, what is peer support? Well, peer support is the giving and receiving help. And it's done from a mutual standpoint. We've learned in Georgia that uh, oftentimes we have been, um, we have been overlooked when it comes to providing services. Uh, someone has always made the decision about what services we should have. Uh, I don't know if that exists here in, in Nebraska, but in Georgia, people sit around the table and decide, well, that is what they need to recover. And all these people are living with a mental health diagnosis. So one of the things that we're learning is that nothing about us without us. So we're demanding, as an individual living with a mental health di uh, diagnosis, I have the right to be at the table when these decisions are made. That is one of the goals of the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network, by the way. We have over 3,500 members, and a part of that process is that um, we advocate, we educate, and we also um, become active in with other stakeholders to design the way the programs in Georgia exist. Uh, this, uh, this, um, sorry, Georgia Mental Consumer Network was started back in 1990, and of course we've grown tremendously over those years. Now, we just recently had our consumer conference. It was the 18th annual consumer conference. It is always held at St. Simon's Island, Georgia. For those of you who, oh yeah, they have some, <laughs> for those of you who don't know where St. Simon's Island, Georgia is, it's between Savannah, Georgia and Jacksonville, Florida. It's a barrier island off the coast of Brunswick where we gather. And this past year, we had over 500 consumers to participate in that three-day rally. Uh, most of whom were scholarship. We were able to get funding from the state, um, uh, the new Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities to actually give a person's opportunity to be there through scholarship. But of course, one of the drawbacks is, is maybe you're experiencing the same thing here is transportation. And we had providers that uh, we gave scholarships to have people attend, but they weren't able to attend because providers weren't willing to transport people to the conference. Otherwise, we could very well have had over 600. So we're really proud about our, um, our, our conference. The main focus of our conference, by the way, was head-to-toe wellness, peer supporting peers. And of course, this was an approach to embody the whole peer whole health wellness. We had uh, keynote speakers such as uh, Peggy Swarbrick, PhD, OTR, CPRP, uh, from, um, where is Peggy from? Is she from where? New Jersey. New Jersey. All right. And we also had Gail Bluebird and uh, Larry Fricks, of course. And I'm sure you guys are familiar with Larry Fricks. Uh, and we really had a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful uh, uh, conference in as much as all the track, educational tracks and breakouts were centered around whole health wellness. So again, receiving help with mutuality and respect. We know that uh, we as individuals, we're not our diagnosis, that we're people. And all we want to do is be treated with dignity and respect. And as an equal in peer uh, support, that is some, one of the things that we offer each other. We also offer each other understanding through what we know to be empathy. Meaning, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I can understand, even though your, your history, lived experience may not be exactly like mine, the fact is that we have something in common. And today we look for more things in common than we do in differences. And in the process of doing that, then I respect you and value you based on your lived experience. Also, um, sharing personal experiences uh, and stories. Uh, one of the things I shared about my personal story is that if I saw George, and I saw George had uh, um, recovered, was in the process of recovering, I figured if he could do it, I could do it. That was nothing to stop me from doing it. Mary Ellen Copeland says all you need is five key recovery concepts. Hope, personal responsibility, education, 
self-advocacy and peer support. And hope I never had. Well, I take that back. I had hoped that one day I'd have a white two-story house with a picket fence around it. I got that idea from watching Leave it to Beaver. <laughs> but somehow my life wasn't going in that direction. So, still, when I saw George, the light flickered again. But that was just the beginning, because with hope, that takes some action. <coughs> there are three bullfrogs on a log, <coughs> on the middle of the lake. One decided to jump into water. How many live on the log? Three bullfrogs on a log in the middle of the lake. One decided to jump into the lake. How many are left? Three. He decided, but he didn't do a darn thing. <laughs> I had decided plenty of times in my life to do something, but I never took the action to make that happen. Faith without works is dead. So in the process that Mary Ellen Copeland has presented to us is that we have to take some action. We want something to change, and we need to take some action. And part of that is suiting up and showing up. I was sharing with a couple this morning that on the way over is that suiting up and showing up is one of the first steps that we make in, as far as recovery is concerned. Encouraging each other through personal experiences. We're unique. My life story is different than yours. My lived experience is different from yours. But one of the things that we do have in common is that we are overcomers. We're achievers. We were knocked down, but we got up. We have no health diagnosis, but we didn't let that lemon keep us down. Instead, we took the lemon and made lemonade. We're living happy, productive lives today. And what I'm doing today is showing my family and my friends and supporters as well that, you know, despite this diagnosis, guess what? I can live. I never thought that'd be possible in my life until I got some hope through the process of seeing another person recover. Here's the thing that was really difficult for me. I had been a failure for a, a, a long time in my life that when people talked about having personal strengths, I couldn't identify one. And I would venture to say that some of you too sitting here would have difficulty identifying what your personal strengths are. Well, some people will say, well, I can only come up with a couple and I don't want to brag on myself. But then we're facing something that is really not our fault. We're facing a maze of negative self-talk. Where does negative self-talk come from? Anybody want to answer? What is negative self-talk? Yes, ma'am. Um, Absolutely. It mm -hmm. comes from others. And so it comes from others. We internalize it and we play that tape over and over again. Somebody says, uh, you can you can do this. No, I can't do that. I can't do that. I've always been told I'd never work again. I'd never be able to get my driver's license back. <laughs> I could never have my own place. I couldn't manage my money. But those, and I believed it. But I'm standing here before you today telling you that through peer support, someone believing in me when I couldn't believe in myself, I'm standing here a changed person. Living what I feel to be a wonderful life. And part of that is because I, uh, I have my wife back in my life. I have six beautiful children who have given me 25 grandchildren with two sets of twins. I tell you, who know my name, <laughs> who don't run for me anymore. So life is good. Life is good. But not only that, I've been able to travel to the United States and meet some wonderful, beautiful people who are just like me, just looking forward to living life on life terms and doing the best that I can with it. And I thank you so much, Carol, for thinking enough of me to allow me to come and share a little something, something with the group, because that says a whole lot of um, what she thinks of me, you know? Uh, and that's, that's one thing we do, is build relationships. Relationships. That was another dilemma for me, because of my lived experience. The lived exp my lived experience was such that I couldn't trust people. Having an intimate relationship with another male after what happened to me, well, it wasn't, it wasn't magic that, 
uh, put me in a position today to accept who I am, but there was a step at a time taking the brick out of the wall that I had put up between you and I to keep you from getting to know exactly who I was and for you getting, keeping you from getting close to me. Well, I realized while I was blocking myself off from you that I was missing out on a lot of learned expertise that you had and a lot of value that you had to share with me. So now I realize when I let people into my life, I'm bring, they're bringing with them a whole host of information and lived experiences that I can benefit for, from. So I'm really happy about that too. And I do have friends, by the way. Now, uh, one of the ways that we talk about as far as becoming a, um, a <coughs> member of uh, being a supporter is um, <coughs> joining support groups. Heather talked about the 12 step programs. Well, church, uh, going to peer groups. I'm really happy about the key. I'm a, I'm a Kia, Kia program, which is similar to what uh, we have in Georgia. It's called the Peer Support Wellness Center. It's open uh, seven days a week. It's uh, similar to what the Kenya program is about to embark upon. That is respite uh, beds. We have three that are in operations. We are going to open up our fourth um, bedroom um, in the coming month. Um, and what happens is that we, the only requirement is for a person to have a proactive interview prior to coming. And you can stay up to seven days. And you can come back. Okay? The proactive interview is only to talk with, and it's run by peers, by the way. Everyone there is a certified peer specialist who has, um, who has uh, experience in working with other people. The only thing you have to do is have a, a, a proactive interview, at which time you actually come in, discuss with the staff what it is you would like to hap have happen during the time that you're at the peer center, um, and identify what you need and what you don't need. That way, if you come, you're not in a position to speak up for yourself. We just pull the file, and this is what uh, um, um, Carol says that she wants during the time she's here. And even though she won't come out of her room, she's indicated that's okay, she needs to insulate, and we'll know that she's okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's the only requirement, and you can come back as often as you like. It's been a big success with us. We are into our uh, 17th month of the operation. Okay, one of the good things that comes with uh, peer support and um, building, attending peer support groups is that we know that there's no uh, judging, no criticism, we accept people for who they are, where they are, and uh, oftentimes that's a good thing because oftentimes we dismiss where people are. We want to fix people. And that's the beauty of peer support is that we don't have the power to fix anybody. As, as, as much as I would love to fix some people in my life, I know that I don't have the power to do that. So all I do is share my experience, strength, and hope and leave the fixing up to a power much greater than myself. But I do accept people where they are, which is one of the beauties that peer support affords me, an opportunity to be with people. And the best thing that I can do for that person is to simply listen, not giving any advice, not trying to fix, not trying to tell them what to do, but simply to listen and give them an opportunity to be where they want to be. If they want me to respond, they ask for me because I am not going to take the voice of an individual from them by giving them advice. And if I give them advice once, they are return to me looking for that advice again, and I may not be there. It's like giving a person a fish. If you give them a fish, they have a meal for a day. But if you teach them to fish, then they can eat a lifetime. And I think that's what peer support brings into the arena, an opportunity to be with people, to learn from others, and be able to identify with strengths that perhaps you never knew you had. And I know for me, it's been a journey where every day is an opportunity to uh, live life uh, on life terms. I have a bunch of chronic conditions that I live with, and often I've been asked, uh, how do you do it? How do you get up after taking eight pills at night and two in the morning? How do you do it? It's simple. I get up, I put my clothes on, and I go. Simple as that. I have not missed taking my medication, and I know that for some people, uh, uh, the idea of having to take medication for the rest of your life is, is one of those things that puts you in depression and despair, but I've learned to accept the fact I only have to take it today. The next day will take care of itself. All I have to do is take my medication today, and who knows, if I maintain my wellness, there may be a cure one day. It's not here yet. But it may be a cure, at least I'll be in a position to get that. Now I'll be well enough to make a decision whether I want it or not. 
What is wanted from supporters? Okay. Um, what is wanted from, uh, well, first of all, a relationship or friendship, um, someone that help you, and sometimes it can be in the form of a family. But if you have a history like mine, when I had burnt all my bridges with my family, who didn't care where I was or what I was doing, as long as I was out of their hair, I learned to find out when going to support groups, I found the family that understood what I wanted, loved me until I was able to love myself, and gave me a sense of hope. And that's what I couldn't get from my blood family because they just couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. They knew it was drugs, but they didn't know why drugs were playing such a major role in my life. Well, I met you, and you helped me to understand that perhaps there was some other issue underneath the use of the drugs and the alcohol. Now, supporters are people who care about me, who accept me as I am, who affirm and validate me and my experience, and um, don't help me figure it out. Hmm, that's a good one. They don't help me figure it out. They accept me for my u uniqueness and what I bring into the relationship that we bring together. And I think when I allow myself to be open enough to accept and look at people for who they are and where they are, then I become a wiser, much better person when it comes to uh, looking at who I am. Respect you and your decisions. Now, it's hard for um, us to realize that we have the power to make our decisions because uh, people have always uh, often made decisions for us. But today I want you to know that uh, the process of recovery is being able to make those decisions and whether they work or don't work, the fact of the matter is I grow from making mistakes. We know that um, recovery is, is uh, not a linear process, but it's more of a non-linear process, which means I have ups and downs. But the value of all that is that through each valley that I go through, I don't forget what I've learned to that point. So I build on what I already know. So I look at how far I've come and what process brought me to where I am. And part of that is being able to connect with peers who understand and trust the fact that, you know, I observe this, I observe that, and I have the wherefore to be open-minded enough to listen and to know that now not shooting me the crap but actually love and care about me and just want to be supportive in my life so i have to learn to accept that and again um i know that unsolicited advice and criticism and judgments won't help me they've always hindered me but uh, today being a part of the uh, peer support system and being a part of uh, the support network i learned that anytime i put myself uh, out there to support somebody, I'm actually supporting myself. The beauty of support is mutuality. It gets me out of my stuff when I can support you. I forget about the problems. I forget about the hole in my shoe if you got no legs. And that's a simple thing that I've learned through this process. And the beauty of that is when someone comes to me and asks me uh, if I have a minute to express or uh, talk to them or listen to them, it's telling me, wow, they think I'm, I'm about something. It builds my self-esteem. And oftentimes, all I have to do is listen because the answers that we seek are usually on the inside. So I've learned to be a good listener. Okay, so I realized that SAMHSA has developed this beautiful, what I think to be a beautiful, beautiful uh, definition of recovery. And I'm gonna read it to you, but it's not so much what SAMHSA says it's what I say, because recovery is unique and personal. For me, it's just being a grandfather and a father and working. For some people, it may just be um, working or being on disability, whatever they choose to do. But Samson says that mental health recovery is a journey of healing and transformation. Remember transformation? I'm going to share this with you and I'm going to quit. But I remember the story of this hunter who went through the forest. And he came across a cocoon. And in the cocoon, he saw this struggling butterfly trying to break free. So he decided he'd take out his pocket knife and slit the cocoon, thinking he was helping the butterfly. But in the process of slitting the cocoon, the butterfly flicked his wings once or twice and fell to the ground and died. Why? 
because the butterfly needed to go through that transformation, the struggle to break free of the cocoon on their own in order to be able to fly away. I don't try to be anybody that opened up the cocoon of that. In fact, I can't make people get it. Nobody made me get it. They just supported me until I got it. And so that's what I want to do today, to be able to be a peer supporter who was willing to uh, support people in this process of growth. And I look forward to being back here in uh, Nebraska in, in, uh, <laughs> in October. I just, I just hope that by that time there's another route to get here. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's like <laughs> traveling the yellow brick road. I mean, you go and you lay over here, you lay over there, but that's all good. That's just a joke. <laughs> but, anyway, but anyway, uh, any questions? I know